Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. At the end of another turbulent year in politics, whether it's at home or abroad, I suppose I'd like to start by asking you about your impressions of the state of UK politics. Um, what do you make of the leadership of your supposed most trusted ally? There's alleged parties at Downing Street, a Prime Minister who may have lied to his own ethics advisor, who also tried to change the rules on lobbying to save one of his own MPs. Is this a trustworthy operator in America's view? Well, Julie, first, thank you for uh, inviting me. As we do come to the end of a, of a certainly challenging but yet foundational year, 2021. In terms of domestic politics, I, I leave British politics for the British people to discuss and debate and decide. Certainly in our country, in the United States, we have plenty of politics for all of you to watch as well. Uh, and I'll just let, uh, let things play out. Uh, of course, uh, as an embassy, we watch these things with great interest. Uh, we read the papers, we watch the TV news, but we also talk with officials. And we're very focused on our joint agenda in terms of security prosperity and uh, all of the challenges we face uh, in a complex world. But this is a story that has cut through in America, it's had a lot of coverage stateside. Indeed, we it, have it, nonstop news everywhere. <laughs> yeah, but th it, it matters whether you consider your closest ally to have a trustworthy leader, doesn't it? What do you think of that? I just came from, uh, from Liverpool, where we had the G7 ministerial meeting, uh, and I was with the Secretary of State for three days. Uh, and what he and President Biden are focused on is working with our allies uh, and our allies choose their own leaders and we work with them very closely, probably no one more closely than the United Kingdom on the array of issues before us, whether it is uh, Russia's uh, activity on the Ukrainian border, uh, whether it's the efforts to uh, get Iran to uh, return to the negotiating table and, and return to the the deal and prevent Iran from uh, getting a nuclear weapon, and the great economic challenges that we all have, uh, particularly uh, in the face of the ongoing COVID pandemic. To go to the core of the story about the alleged parties at Downing Street, do you understand the fury of those who lost loved ones and who stuck to the rules? Again, I'll, I'll let British people deal with British politics. This has been a challenging year for everybody in my country as well. I came here uh, at the 1st of August as we were opening up with great hope. Of course, we've had more challenges uh, now as Omicron threatens us all. And both our countries, the whole world, in fact, is uh, trying to deal with this. Use the lessons that we've learned. Focus on vaccination. That third jab, as, uh, as you call it, uh, the booster shot, as we more often say, uh, and try to, again, get through this as we move into 2022. Let's talk about Ukraine then. You've just been at the G7 with foreign ministers um, alongside, of course, Secretary of State Blinken. Um, it's extremely dangerous, this situation, uh, with the Russian troop build-up on the border with Ukraine. Um, I mean, Russia is already terrorising Ukraine. Why hasn't that in itself triggered a response? We know that clearly the G7 have spoken about dire consequences, but we're already in an extremely dangerous situation, aren't we? Indeed, I mean, Secretary Blinken, President Biden, uh, the leadership here and in uh, so many countries around the world have expressed deep and grave concerns about the massive, unprecedented Russian military buildup. Some say the largest buildup since World War II along the Ukrainian border. And uh, the president has focused on what he calls relentless diplomacy, uh, the way he approaches all big challenges in the world. Uh, in saying to the Russians, uh, you need to pull back, uh, you need to dial this down, uh, and that if you make a move, if you have uh, aggressive activity, there will be dire consequences. And you see the G7 countries and others united in that position. But there has been no signal at all that President Putin is dialing anything down, despite having had that meeting over the phone line the Zoom link with President Putin, there is no sign that he is shifting at all, is there? Well, indeed, face-to-face -face diplomacy, whether it is virtual by Zoom, as we've gotten so used to, uh, is an important step. We'll have to see where the Russians go. I think the G7, with their statement just yesterday, made very clear again that the massive and serious consequences for Russian action uh, should be considered. Ultimately, I have no crystal ball uh, to know what President Putin is thinking now or what he will do. 
But our job, the job of deterrence and diplomacy, is to make very clear uh, the seriousness of the consequences and to remind him of the options, and that is diplomacy, returning to the efforts uh, through uh, the Normandy process led by Britain and France to uh, see full Im implementation of the Minsk agreements. Uh, and uh, that has been in place, of course, already since the earlier Russian actions in eastern Ukraine. Will the U.S. continually and persistently rule out categorically sending in any of its own troops into the arena? I will leave those kinds of statements for the president, for the secretary of state, but what I can reiterate is what you've seen just in the past 24 hours, including from the secretary of state here in Great Britain, in Liverpool, uh, united with uh, our allies, the G7 representing over half of the world's GDP, a collection of democracies determined to focus on using the rules-based international order to make a, a better world for all of us and to caution and warn Russia about the seriousness and the potential consequences. Uh, I mean, isn't the truth that <clears throat> President Putin now looks at the US, it remembers Kabul, and we'll talk about that in a moment, it looks at Syria and knows that the US will not act militarily. He knows now that that is the way that President Biden is shaping his foreign policy. That's the truth, isn't it? I would not rule out any actions. Uh, so you, wouldn't, again, I would you leave, wouldn't rule out any military actions? I would leave that to the president to decide what is in the best interests of the security and interests of the United States and our allies, including Great Britain. And he does that by consulting, by focusing from day one on uh, repairing, uh, revitalizing our alliances. I think that has been uh, widely successful. You've seen the president carefully and deliberately work with allies uh, as we have through this G7 process, as we did in recent weeks at NATO, even using the OSCE, the structures which are developed uh, over many decades to deal with these challenges. But that's not a, a strict ruling out, potentially, of military action. Again, that's something for the president to address. Uh, what I can tell you, as his representative here in the United Kingdom, is what he is doing uh, with his counterparts, with our allies, what Secretary Blinken is doing, traveling relentlessly uh, around the world, uh, engaging uh, on a constant basis uh, with key allies and partners, on the wide range uh, of issues. And the president has, has focused uh, on all of the crucial challenges. What he has seen are really the key things we need to focus on in terms of protecting our security in the months and years ahead. And, and just briefly, President Putin's made it clear that he'd like to see President Biden face to face. Will that happen? Again, those are things for the White House to, uh, to discuss and decide. I think Zoom has become a, a very effective uh, tool I will note that the president was in Glasgow at COP26 with perhaps the largest gathering in person of world leaders, uh, strictly focused on COVID protocols while we dealt with what is perhaps the most existential uh, issue. Uh, and the president has made this clear from day one uh, after his inauguration when he put the United States back into the Paris process in dealing with climate change. Let's just reflect a little on President Biden's first year in office. When he took office, President Biden said the US would engage with the world once again. We'll lead not merely by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. What example did the US set in its disastrous pullout from Afghanistan, do you think? I think the president was very deliberative, uh, and those who followed uh, his campaign, in fact, followed what uh, Joe Biden had been saying for some time was that 20 years and $2 trillion of effort in Afghanistan was enough, that the interests of the security, prosperity uh, of the American people uh, were better served by ending our military presence there, bringing an end to that 20 years uh, in the post 9-11 experience, uh, and focusing on the great challenges we have, whether it is the inflection point on climate or one on democracy, and an autocracy. But, uh, but on a human level, Ambassador, what did, what did you think when you saw people falling from aircraft as the US scrambled that airlift out of Kabul? People so desperate that they were clinging to the outside of aircraft as the US took off. What did you think when you saw those pictures? Imagery is always searing and, and powerful and will always be with us. 
but one has to be able to step back and look at what was accomplished. These are human lives. 130,000 people were evacuated in an extraordinary effort that has not gotten the attention uh, that I believe it should have by the United States military and diplomats on the ground, by the United Kingdom, by others, uh, to bring those people out after the Afghan government, the Afghan institutions, collapsed in an unbelievable process that no one could have uh, anticipated the, the speed of that. Uh, and it just reminds you of the desperation of people to seek democracy and opportunity, uh, which is not something I think the Taliban uh, is offering right now, but we remain dedicated to working with humanitarian efforts, and we've put forward this year alone almost half a billion dollars to that effort in Afghanistan. I mean, the World Health Organization is predicting a million children under five will die of starvation this winter in Afghanistan. I, as you say, the US Treasury has, has permitted some payments to Afghanistan uh, just in this past week, but not nearly enough. People look at that situation and think that this was a moral dereliction of duty on behalf of the US. I think we've done a tremendous amount to give the people of Afghanistan an opportunity to rebuild their own institutions and government, those we support. But the women there can't with, even go to work. And, and that's what uh, we've pointed out many times about the Taliban. Their government, their institutions walked away from that. And the president has determined that in our interests, we will of course continue to provide humanitarian assistance as we can to work with our international partners, including the United Kingdom, uh, to try to help the people of Afghanistan uh, and continue to put pressure on the Taliban and that regime to live up to international norms and standards, uh, including a focus on human rights. Um, isn't it the truth that the world expected something different from this president? Um, that the doctrine actually is still pretty closely aligned to President Trump's, as in America first? I think it's actually far from, from that uh, position. Of course, he has to focus on those who elected him. But he has said from the beginning, as he said in his campaign, that he would be focusing on revitalizing, rebuilding our alliances and partnerships because the challenges that face us in the world, whether it's climate or the conflict between authoritarianism and democracy, are things we cannot do alone. And so we must work with partners. We've been doing that. You've seen the president back. You've seen a summit for democracy to focus on the challenges there. You've seen COP26, an extraordinary gathering of uh, international uh, leadership, and real positive movement. Now begins the decade in which we have to focus, as John Kerry has said, on, on carrying out those pledges. This is what the Biden administration has done, realigning uh, our focus in terms of, of uh, strategy for those things that meet the challenges of 2021, not of uh, 20 years ago. You mentioned there that <clears throat> the president has just concluded a summit that he called on democracy. What spectacle of democracy did the U.S. offer the world on January the 6th, nearly a year ago? It's a great challenge, and as the president himself has said, uh, we too in the United States face this, uh, this conflict uh, of, uh, as our Constitution said, ever uh, more perfect union, never declaring that we've gotten there, and uh, there's a lot of dialogue in the United States on this. There are great political divides. It's a world that is uh, uh, transformed almost daily by technology, social media, uh, malign influences, uh, and differing views. And we've got to find ways uh, to show that democracy delivers for its people. Unlike, say, the Chinese leader who believes that democracy is outdated and cannot keep up with uh, the ponderous nature uh, or the ponderous nature of democracy can't keep up with the technological change. Uh, that's what President Biden is determined to show and to work with others. We don't have all the answers. We have to work with others, like-minded countries, those of our allies who share our fundamental values, like the United Kingdom. What would it mean to have President Trump back for America and for American democracy? Oh, goodness, Julie, that's, that's really not a question for a, a U.S. diplomat to answer overseas. Every American has his or her own views on our domestic politics, uh, but we keep those, those to ourselves. Uh, that's what uh, others can discuss, that's what reporters can debate, uh, and I'll leave that to you. Um, let's talk about the relationship with the UK, between the US and the UK. I mean, everybody knows it, 
as the special relationship. Some roll their eyes <laughs> at the term. Um, we haven't got a permanent ambassador yet. We can't seem to get a trade deal either with the US. What's gone wrong? Well, let's unpack those. Uh, I am honored that Secretary Blinken and President Biden asked me to come here as the interim ambassador. As the secretary said this weekend, I'm glad we have an ambassador while we wait for the ambassador. As you've seen before, our system uh, often results in gaps, uh, particularly in Europe where we have numerous uh, non-career, non-professional diplomats but in ambassadorial But half of the 186 posts. ambassadorial posts are vacant around the world. That's, that's not America that's, back, that's is it? That's right, because, but, but we have strong diplomats, Julie, and, uh, and we remain incredibly engaged. Uh, I wouldn't put so much stock in the process of selecting, uh, vetting, nominating and confirming ambassadors. Indeed, it has been a challenge this time. It's always a challenge after an election because the appointees that a president has made, the non-career appointees, depart with the exiting administration. Uh, that's the case, of course, uh, here in the UK. Uh, but to I expect been, to, 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 sorry, sorry to interrupt the flow, but to have been for nearly 12 months now without an ambassador, a permanent ambassador, in this key relationship begs a lot of questions, doesn't it, of this president? I'm not sure what the questions are of the president, well, commitment actually. commitment to the country and dialogue. I think I've been incredibly committed. The president has been incredibly committed. He's been to the UK twice. He's made two trips abroad as president, both of them to the United Kingdom. Uh, I think there's probably no world leader he talks to more often than Prime Minister Johnson, his counterpart. The Secretary of State has been here four times. Uh, I accompanied him in my previous role as the senior diplomat for Europe in May. Uh, he was back, of course, uh, for the, uh, the, the COP, uh, and we were just together again uh, in Liverpool. Uh, so every day I see the incredible breadth and depth of the U.S. bilateral relationship at a diplomatic level, at a military level, with our intelligence communities, with our law enforcement communities. I'm really amazed at uh, what our embassy uh, does with its UK counterparts. So let's talk about trade deals. President Trump imposed big tariffs on steel imports from the EU and the UK. The EU have had theirs lifted by President Biden. The UK hasn't. Now, it's been reported, and there's been a, a leak in the British media, that this is down to the UK's threat to override the Northern Ireland Protocol, triggering Article 16. Is that what is stopping the US lifting this tariff on steel from the UK? No, as I confirmed with Secretary Blinken this week, as Trade Secretary Trevelyan heard in Washington last week, there is no linkage between those two things. What is known as Section 232, the, uh, the, the tariffs on steel and aluminum or aluminium. I've been here long enough. I can say it. I've been practicing. Uh, we're working on. And uh, these things take time. There is a process. Indeed, we were able to move forward uh, with the EU on the same process. And the Commerce Department and our trade representative put out a statement at that same time how we would be working for, uh, with the UK on this. Uh, trade officials from the UK are in uh, the United States this week, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Amory Trevelyan just returned. Mm -hmm. So I think that process is underway. The broader context of uh, trade agreements, I think, is often misunderstood. Uh, one would think that there was no trade between the United States and the UK, listening to some of the reports and rhetoric. We are the first and fifth largest economies in the world. We trade in goods and services, over $220 billion every year. We have one and a half trillion dollars in investment going back and forth. Millions of jobs on both sides of the Atlantic due to that. And we are working uh, on areas where we can make trade uh, flow better, remove barriers. Uh, ultimately, as the president has said, uh, we will focus on uh, broader trade agreements after we make the investments in America's economy and workers. And he's got major legislation moving through Congress that take vital attention now and will allow us after that to move forward. The infrastructure bill, the Build Back Better legislation, and I think then trade agreements more broadly, which take time to work and negotiate, 
uh, can come into play. But, but if we have a special relationship, allegedly, why has the US just given the EU a competitive advantage over the, over the UK on steel? Look, things have to happen one at a time. You, you, you can well, it's simple just to negotiate the, with one uh, country, isn't it, rather than the whole of the EU? And, and as, we, as they have announced, those that negotiate these things, they are working on that, the 232 uh, tariffs. Uh, again, I think we just have to let these things catch up, but focus on what we are doing day to day. And other steps we're taking, like uh, removing, uh, as the President uh, promised, the uh, prohibitions on British uh, lamb uh, exports, which will begin next year back to the United States. Um, just, just, just to finish that sort of section, if you like, um, just to be clear, what is the message from America to the UK on the threat of triggering Article 16 and overriding the Northern Ireland po Protocol? What is the message that you sent to the UK government? Uh, on, on Northern Ireland, look, uh, President Biden has been very clear uh, for years, well preceding his presidency, in fact, uh, his support for a secure and prosperous Northern Ireland in which both communities there have a voice and enjoy gains in, in the hard-won peace that was brought through the Belfast uh, Good Friday Agreement. What we have said as a neutral, uh, neutral friend uh, to all sides in this is that we recognize there have been some challenges in implementing the Northern Ireland Protocol between the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom, um, and that the path forward should be a pragmatic one in resolving those issues, reducing the drama, reducing rhetoric, and finding solutions, again, through diplomacy, back to this theme of relentless diplomacy, dialogue, and discussions. And that's the message that, uh, that the UK has heard from the President, from the Secretary, from myself on a regular basis, from all interlocutors. Our Congress, too, has a great interest in this. And uh, we have, for our part, tried to help make sure our Congress, uh, individual congressmen and more broadly, understand the dynamic here. Similarly, we pass messages to the EU through our mission there in Brussels uh, of the, to the same effect. There are ways forward on this, and that's really what we want to see, uh, a pragmatic solution. Just a couple more questions before we conclude. <clears throat> I should ask you about Omicron, which has suddenly loomed so large, hasn't it, in terms of an emergency. Um, we know that President Biden is tackling this, uh, trying to tackle this in the US. Do you think a US travel ban for Brits might be on the table? I've seen no further uh, indication of, of that. Any announcements in that sort, of course, would come from, uh, from Washington, from uh, the White House or appropriate authorities. We were able to reopen travel in, uh, in early November, as you'll recall. Uh, that was an enormous accomplishment, uh, well overdue in, in many people's views. Uh, but again, taking into account what we've learned about uh, the pandemic and how to deal with it, I think what the president has said now, we're focusing on vaccination, uh, that third booster shot uh, of the vaccine, and uh, that that is the key, as well as taking the, the mindful steps, testing, masking, social distancing. We keep washing our hands, uh, and, and we're mindful of, of, uh, of what we do and to try to prevent this uh, and see how we move into the, the new year. I should ask you about some of the coverage that your president gets in the UK media. Um, often as an elderly man who falls asleep at major conferences, um, who doesn't seem vigorous, makes verbal errors, and far cry, as some would see it, from being a dynamic, <clears throat> energetic operator. Um, is his health in good shape? And can people rely on him as a solid world leader? I was with the president uh, in Glasgow at COP26, and I was impressed by his vigor, frankly, in the agenda uh, and the schedule. He kept those two days, having come from uh, an extensive trip uh, that included the G20 uh, in Italy. Uh, he had bilateral meetings. He had multilateral meetings. Uh, I helped organize uh, a bilateral meeting between the president and uh, the Prince of Wales, for example. Uh, he is focused uh, like a laser on the climate issues, working very closely with Secretary Kerry and Secretary of State Blinken and all of the experts. And I think he was very pleased and determined to be uh, at COP and to be here for the, the full time. 
So that's what I can tell you from personal observance. He was energized, in fact, uh, as he left, imagining the array of, of issues that, uh, that the president is dealing with on any given day. Uh, I think he is showing the leadership that he described uh, and on which he was elected, uh, and he'll keep at that, including the domestic agenda, but also the fundamentals of our international approach, relentless diplomacy, focus on, uh, on working with uh, allies, uh, revitalizing alliances, partnerships around the world, uh, and facing the threats, whether it's the Russians and Ukraine, making clear to President Putin that the United States would like to see a more stable, predictable relationship with Russia, but that we are going to respond to aggressive, reckless behavior. And with China, similarly, saying, look, we are ready to continue working with China, competing with China where necessary, but there are rules of the road, and China has to stand up to those as well, including in the human rights mm -hmm. realm. Two, two quick questions to conclude. Will we get an ambassador next year? Yes or no? I can never predict anything. Again, I don't have the crystal ball, uh, but you have an ambassador, and I'm <laughs> delighted and honored to be here and do my best to lead our team of over a thousand diplomats in the UK uh, and to work with a marvelous array of UK counterparts on the broad agenda we have. And just in conclusion, you, you've just spent, in the last couple of weeks, you've been traveling all around the UK. You've been to Northern Ireland, you've been to Scotland. You, as we head into 2022, you know, there's obviously been a lot of questions about the, the state of the union here. What do you make of the state of the union here in the United Kingdom? It is great to be able to, to travel around, whether it's my first trip to Liverpool, a trip to Manchester, Glasgow and Edinburgh, to visit our consulates there and in Belfast, uh, and to understand the, the diversity of the United Kingdom. And uh, just as in the United States, we are a diverse country, uh, perhaps larger in scale geographically, uh, but it is that diversity that gives us strength, the diversity in history and background, in outlook and uh, economic focus. Uh, and that's, I think, a strength that uh, cannot be uh, overestimated. I think uh, united is the word that, in fact, unites the United States, the United Kingdom, and we are united uh, in this special relationship uh, in pursuing security, prosperity on the basis of broadly shared values. And I do believe as we go into 2022, that will continue to be a strong and historic partnership. Ambassador Riga, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.